Um, I'm going to read here in a second, but first I want, I want Deshaun to come up and read first. Um, I want to tell you why I picked Deshaun's piece. Out of, there, were, there were 13 really wonderful pieces. The reason I picked Deshaun's piece is the hardest thing in nonfiction, I find, is subtext. Um, I feel like with poetry and, non and fiction, you don't get in the door without subtext. Whereas in nonfiction, which mimics sort of an explicit medium and sort of like this is what happened and this is what's really going on, um, you're not encouraged to, to have subtext as much. And what we have in Deshaun's piece is really interesting subtext. We have the thing that he's talking about and the other thing that's going on and how it links together is the central uh, core of the narrator. And it makes the piece come alive and big and wide in ways that uh, a lot of nonfiction sometimes falls flat. And so, Deshaun, please. All right, uh, I'm Deshaun Mosley. I'm a second year. And uh, the essay I'll be reading is titled Dark Matter. All that research I did reading and rereading articles from different scientific journals, watching the same episode of Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman six times, Googling general relativity and the Schwarzschild radius and primordial black holes and black hole thermodynamics, and for what? Just so I can tell you something you likely won't consider profound or new or even relevant to the things you care about, the things normal people care about, well, here it is. Black holes rip stars from our universe that have been around for billions of years as if they never belonged and swallow them. Black holes devour. Like I said, you may not care, but I do. I don't have a choice, so don't hold that against me. Don't turn around and carry on a conversation with someone else. Joan Didion wrote that writing is the act of saying I, of imposing oneself upon other people, of saying listen to me, see it my way, change your mind. And that's what I need right now. For you to sit somewhere that's quiet and dedicate yourself to flipping a couple of pages and wasting some minutes of your day, listening to me ramble about the things I've lost and can't get a hold of. My brothers, my sister, as if they are the stars that get too close to a black hole and before you know it, are drawn into its gravitational pull and disappear and never return. My brother Quinte died three minutes after his birth. This was the first disappearance, the first gravitational theft. I was five years old. I don't remember the day my mother went into labor. I wasn't in the room or even at the hospital when it happened. Someone took a picture of my mother holding Quinte for the first time, only minutes after his newborn heart stopped beating, when doctors failed to bring him back and scrambled to figure out what went wrong. My mother showed me the photo a year ago. You've seen this before, she said. I shook my head no. The memory had disappeared. Later, I asked if I attended Quinte's funeral, and she assured me I did. I wore black just like everyone else. I said goodbye. Black holes devour. Two years after Quinte's death, my mother had more children. First my sister Genevia, then my brother Titus. On school days, I completed all my assignments while I rode the bus home. So when I got there, I could take Genevia and Titus from her and let her rest. Most days, I carried Titus in my arms while following Genevia as she crawled or walked through the house. I wanted to make sure she stayed out of trouble. For the most part, she did. I wish I could say the same about our mother, but there are robberies, guns and masks, just like the movies worn by the sort of people you hear about while watching 48 Hours or America's Most Wanted. My mom was one of those people, and she drove the getaway car. She got called. The night she told me she was headed to prison, I lay across my bed, seized a fistful of sheets, and sobbed. She called me back into the living room, wiping her own eyes, so she could tell me to stop crying because everything would be all right and asked who I would want to live with while she served her time. I didn't have anyone particular in mind, 
nor did I care a whole lot about who it turned out to be, just as long as Genevia, Titus, and I remain together. I haven't seen Genevia and Titus in almost six years. Black holes devour. The first couple of months into her prison sentence, my mother learned she was pregnant again. I found out and panicked. When she gave birth to Titus, she lost so much blood. The doctors gave her transfusion after transfusion, told her if she ever got pregnant again, she would die giving birth. But she didn't die. She had my brother, Jacaria. When the hospital discharged her, the Florida Department of Children and Families took him away and gave him to a foster family. I didn't speak to Jacario until he was five and I was 16. My mother wrote the family's phone number in the top left corner of a letter she sent me. A woman answered, and after I explained who I was, I'm Jacario's brother, can I speak to him please? She called him to the phone. Hey Deshaun, he said. It was the way he said it, as if there weren't hundreds of miles separating Tallahassee, Florida from Florence, South Carolina as if we had met before and he knew what grade I was in and how old I was, even though he asked those questions and more. And I answered them all, even his last one. Are you coming to Florida? I listened to the static in the phone, the only thing making noise while I put words together. I don't know. I left it at that. Black holes devour. Two weeks ago on a Monday, my sister Ronasia was born. I didn't hear about it until the following Friday. It's happening again, I thought. Not now, I told myself. We're not going to think about this right now. I visited Ronasia and my mother. I even held my new sister carefully, assuming only my mother's touch could keep her calm, and the second I picked her up, she would scream. Instead, she slept. Her stomach rose and fell, and her fingers extended once or twice in search of the tangible. She was beautiful. She's not gone yet, I reminded myself. Ranesha stirred in my arms and faced me, and if her eyes had been open, I would have seen a reflection of myself in them. Someone haggard and afraid of the weeks and months and years to come, afraid of the time spent worrying. Will I see Genevieve and Titus again? before I go off to college? Will I meet Jacario before the judge decides whether or not to grant the foster family full custody? Will the state of South Carolina get word that both my mother and Ronasia are living inside a one bedroom house with my mother's boyfriend and his uncle and take Ronasia away? And just like that, I forget about her. Like I've forgotten other things, details, faces, people. I've been known to overthink hype the threat. Maybe there is no black hole, and it's me. I just can't put all this behind me. And I should want to. My mother is back now. Why dwell on the days when she was gone? Why dwell on the fact that Genevia, Titus, and Jacario are still out there somewhere? Why not just enjoy this moment? You're holding your baby sister for the first time. This could be the only time. But let's not think about that. Let's not think about anything except how small Ranasia is. She must weigh so little. Weight is the gravitational pull on an object. It's what keeps us grounded. It's what keeps us here. Black holes always devour. Thank you. It's always hard to. Uh to pick, uh, you know, student writing to go before yours because uh, there's a moment where you, you say to yourself, oh wait, I have to follow that? <laughs> um, it was just such a lovely essay. Thank you so much, thank you. Um, uh, so my book, uh, The Answer to the Riddle is Me, um, is named after a lyric um, from a De La Soul song, De La Soul, who just gave away all of their catalog on Valentine's Day. If you missed it, I'm sorry. Um, but how wonderful uh, for them to give their entire catalog away. Um, they have a hard time getting on iTunes because they sample so much um, that it's in, legally impossible for them to get on iTunes. Um, but this comes from their third album, which is 
criminally under listened to uh, called Balloon Mind State. And the lyric goes, the answer to the riddle is me, and here's the question. <clears throat> I was standing too when I came down, not when I came to. How you doing? <laughs> Let me just start again. I was standing when I came to, not lying down. And it wasn't a gradual waking process. It was darkness, 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 then snap, me, now awake. It was hot. My thin shirt clung to my back and shoulders, and my underwear was bunched into a sweaty wad. The heat left the ground in wavy lines, and the air was tinged blue with diesel exhaust. A woman in a burqa pushed past me. A small man in a ragged red vest ducked around me. He was hunched under the massive steel trunk on his back. The corner of the trunk nicked my shoulder as he maneuvered by. I was in the center of a crowd, half surging for the train, half surging for the exits. I stood still. I had no idea who I was. This fact didn't panic me at first. I didn't know enough to panic. In front of me was a train, a heaving, shuddering train. Its engine, half submerged in smoke, painted a deep red. It blasted its horns, then clanked and panted into motion. People waved to me from open windows as the train shook itself free of the station. I tracked the train's slow motion progress. As I choked on the bursts of blue exhaust and stared at the receding last car, I wondered if I should have been on that train. I checked my front pockets for a ticket. Nothing, not even a passport. Now I began to worry. I had lost my passport. I was in a train station in a foreign country without my passport. Then I realized that I couldn't even think of what name would have been on a passport I, if I had one or what foreign country I was currently in. This is when I panicked. A man in a small nearby stall clanked a pan against a propane burner. He banged and scraped a spatula against the pan that clanged against the metal burner. The sound was impossibly loud louder than the train had been. I wanted to ask the man for help. I didn't want the man to know I needed help. I wanted him to stop banging the pan. I could feel a heavy absence in my brain like a static cloud. I couldn't remember anything past waking up. There was a thick mass of nothing up there. My muscles were taut, caught in a constant flinch, waiting for someone, anyone, to punch me. I was alone, alone with no idea how far I was from anyone who knew me. I was alone and empty and terrified. I wiped my face with both palms. I blacked out. I woke up, and I was still standing there on the bustling concrete platform. Not knowing how long I had before I'd black out again, I tried to formulate a plan. There were small monkeys scavenging among the train tracks. Pigeons pecked among the detritus, then flew what they found up to the peaked roof where they nested in the gaps between the beams and corrugated metal. A television hung from one of the metal rafters flickering from, with information. My neck craned. I watched as unfamiliar letters flashed on the screen. I couldn't read them. Did I forget how to read? I needed it to make sense. If I was going to get out of here, I needed the words to make sense. The screen was old, emitting a low buzz and the columns frequently twisted from one side to the other like there was a tug of war among the vacuum tubes inside the black box. The screen went blank, and I was surprised when it came on again that it was filled with something that I could understand. I experienced a moment of exhilaration fueled by the simple recognition of typed English. The train names, though, were anything but clear. The Jean Mabumi Express, the Bhubaneswar Express. I watched the screen as a drowning man watches the arc of a thrown life preserver, I tried to will the words to make sense, to be useful, to pull me out of whatever I was sinking into, but the screen went blank and cycled to an unfamiliar language. Each time it came back to English, I experienced the same adrenaline rush. The words continued to twist on the screen. I don't know how long I stared at it, long enough to draw attention. Someone tapped me on the shoulder. I reluctantly panned my gaze down from the monitor and saw a young man wearing a peaked cap he carried a long wooden stick, and perched above his lip, he had a slight mustache. The mustache looked unsure of, of whether or not it would last till the end of the week. Is there something the matter here? He asked me. He looked kind. He looked competent. 
I needed something now that the television wasn't cooperating. Anything resembling comfort or competence would do. I have no idea who I am, I said. Some dam burst inside of me as soon as I said it. I started crying. The man took a moment to consider his strategy. He finally decided on, there, there. He patted me on my shoulder. I am a tourist police officer. He pointed to a complicated bureaucratic mandala sewn on his shoulder. I am here for you. I have seen this many times before. You foreigners come to my country and do your drugs and get confused. It will be all right, my friend. I was relieved. I should have known. This was the kind of trouble drug addicts ended up in all the time. It was serious, but I was thankful that this police officer had let me know who I was and that I wasn't to be trusted. I knew who I was. He'd given me a key to my identity. I didn't have a name, but I now knew the kind of person I was. Do you have on your person anything like a passport? I shook my big sobbing head, suddenly a puddle again. Prompted by the man's assessment of me, I started to remember doing drugs with an unattractive redhead in a dark apartment. Her ginger face was covered in acne and nickel-sized freckles. Images of her coming toward me, twirling little baggies full of toxic stuff flickered in my brain, cooking, injecting, snorting, scoring. This is what drug addicts do. Then they get lost and end up on train platforms taxing the patience of good men. Do you have anything like a wallet on your person? I patted down my back pockets, afraid that I would have nothing to report, but out of my right back pocket I produced a brown leather lump stamped with a picture of a cowboy with guns drawn. I do, I said. My tears turned joyful. I flipped the wallet open and there was a New Mexico driver's license. I shoved my finger on the square inch picture. That's me! I was electric with happiness. I had been found. <laughs> okay, Mr. David, the man said. My name is Rajesh. You may call me Josh. You are an American. It will be easier for you to call me that. <laughs> I wanted to grab him and dance with him. I had a name and a nationality now. The sterile emptiness of my immediate waking was gone. I bounced from sobbing to smiling in seconds. Josh pocketed my wallet and grabbed my bicep. Let us get you somewhere safe. He escorted me off the platform and into the main hall of the train station where there was a wall of ticket sellers behind bars who were slowly dispensing with a crush of people who looked like they were meant to push themselves through the bars into the ticket sellers' laps. The cavernous room was thick with language I didn't understand. With his hand kindly clamped on my upper arm, Josh pulled me through the hall. Everyone we passed turned and watched. So Josh uh, Rajesh took me to a, wait, I'll call him Josh because I'm an American and it'll be easier for me to call him that. Um, took me to a, a guest house uh, where they take lost sheep foreign tourists. Um, and he took me there with a purpose. Uh, Mrs. Lee, her guest house, her son, when um, he went to visit Singapore, uh, OD'd on heroin, and his remains got shipped back to her in a uh, cardboard box. And she kept that cardboard box in the corner of her room. And so what Josh and Mrs. Lee did was hold an impromptu uh, intervention for me, um, telling me that what I was doing by taking these drugs was killing my mother. Um, Mrs. Lee then began to cry. I cried right back at her. It was people like me who had killed her son. People like me. I put my hand on hers and told her I was sorry, that I'd do better, that I was done with all of the drugs forever. My insides felt like they'd just fallen into an abandoned well. The gray static and fuzz from before was replaced with a black hopelessness. Mrs. Lee took a napkin, folded it three times, wiped at her black eyes, and excused herself. Josh pulled his cap off his knee and leaned forward, his forearm settling on his thighs. Now you see why I brought you here. She is a woman who can teach you things. He took a si sip from his tea. He smacked his legs with open palms, signaling the end of the lesson. At that moment, Mrs. Lee came back into the room, the napkin still in her hands. Let me show you where you'll be staying. 
We climbed a flight of stairs and entered a small room with a bureau, a chair, a mattress on the floor, and a lamp on a small table beside the mattress. An off-balance ceiling fan spastically stirred the air. I walked directly to the window. There was a narrow balcony outside, and I yanked at the glass door to reach it. Here. It needs to be unlocked first. Mrs. Lee bent down and flicked a piece of metal, and the door opened with a screech. On the street, a man pushed a cart loaded with stacks of paper. He rang a bell as he walked and called out to each of the houses. Four puppies rolled and snapped at one another in the gutter. There was a braid of wrist-thick black electrical cables coming out of a pipe not five feet from the balcony. They swayed heavily in the breeze and stretched across the street, stitching the buildings together. Cinch them tight, and you'd close the open wound of the street. There was a flutter of movement above me. Three small children chased each other around the open roof of the opposite building. On the building next door to that one, a pair of children stared straight into the sky while fiddling with their hands. I craned my neck to see what they saw, a kite. The string was nearly invisible in their hands and in the sky, but the small patch of color above was clearly leashed to them. Something whirred in my brain. I stared again at the building opposite. On the roof was a small flat. That's my apartment, I told Mrs. Lee. Excitement crackled in my throat. Damn, I can never get that wrong. That's my apartment, I told Mrs. Lee. Excitement crackled in my throat. You know, it's the excitement crackled in my throat comes after. I always forget. I apologize. We'll start again. <laughs> I pictured pushing open the door and finding the squalid flat where Christina and I used to hold ourselves up in while we shot up with heroin and whatever else we could find. The flat was dark. Even during the day, it was dark. Miserable with the laughably thin mattress where Christina and I would crash and moan between highs. Standing on Mrs. Lee's balcony, I yearned to go over there, yank the padlock off the door and enter into my horrible and wasted life. I could see now, though, how bad this was. I could go over there and collect the redhead and get us some help. Mrs. Lee and Josh would help us. We'd be okay. You don't live there, Mrs. Lee corrected. I do. I just rented the place. No one lives there, she said. It's abandoned. Right. It was. Then I moved in. I was sweating with conviction. Why was Mrs. Lee trying to keep me from my apartment? Suddenly I was awash in paranoia. Mrs. Lee and Josh were the ones who drugged me. They were trying to keep me away from Christina. They were trying to rob me. I wasn't confused. They were making me confused. That's my apartment, I said again, pleading with Mrs. Lee to let me go. Mrs. Lee grasped my shoulders and said, this is not your flat. Do you think you could move into my neighborhood and me not know about it? She was right. But if that wasn't my apartment, how in the world was I remembering it so vividly? Now I couldn't be sure of the memories that I did have. Everything was suspect. I was worse than a drug addict. I was nothing. A drug addict could cry over his wasted life. I didn't know what my tears were for. It was only an absence. I cried for something I didn't know. The braid of black wires swaying in the breeze now asserted itself as a fair ending. I could jump out and grab them, end this, sizzle away this not knowing, let the people in the street scrape me off of their sandals, send the inky fried residue to my mother in a box, give it to her to cry over when guests come. Let me jump, let me end this, please. Mrs. Lee turned me and led me back inside. She handed me a napkin and I wiped my eyes and blew my nose. She smoothed my hair with her palm. So, I wasn't a drug addict, um, and there is no woman named Christina, um, though I can picture her right now as well as I can see any of your faces. I know Christina, even though she's never existed. Um, my brain was so desperate for any sort of narrative that it invented a whole life um, of being a drug addict. I was uh, there on a Fulbright scholarship, um, uh, doing linguistic stuff that is, well, I'm at University of Chicago. It's right up your alley. Um, um, and uh, usually I say it's too nerdy, you guys. Um, um, and so I was there um, 
to do that, and my parents came and got me. After Mrs. Lee um, puts me upstairs, uh, things get worse. I start hallucinating very heavily. Um, I get transferred to a mental institution where I get strapped down. Um, I punch a nurse at some time. Uh, I dropped her. Um, it's a weird thing to have punched a nurse. Um, uh, and uh, after a couple of days of hallucinating really heavily, I finally was on enough antipsychotics that I came out of it. And then my parents showed up. Um, and my parents took me home. And this will be the last section I, I, I read. Um, on the plane, my parents kept at it. One watching over me while the other slept. I had the middle seat between them. One of their hands was always on me. Dad had brought a CD and a portable player for me. Apparently, I had hosted a classic country radio show on New Mexico State University's student station. It was called the Baby Tiger Tri Hour, and I played a lolly, lot of Dolly Parton, George Jones, Hank Williams, Jimmy Rogers, and Loretta Lynn. My on-air persona was intense. I opened with a fast-talking, countryfied accent and thanked people for turning in so darned early in the morning, saying that I knew they had things to do, and I was there to put on music for them to do them things too. I told people I knew they were just cleaning the muck out of their eyes, butter and toast, walking the dog, getting out of the shower. And here, I got really quiet and told people that if they were just getting out of the shower, that they should stand up right up next to their speakers. I told them that they should drop their towels and lean in close, and I would talk them dry, letting the vibrations of the speakers do the work. Then I played a Conway Twitty song. <laughs> I was starting to learn who I was. There was a crazy person bellowing and talking nonsense between the songs. It was this person who was supposed to be me. I sat between my parents with my headphones on listening. I knew that what I was listening to was at least a partial truth about myself. The person who was talking between the songs was me, but me while I was performing a part. The me who was on the plane listening to the me who was barking in the headphones decided that I needed to start acting like that DJ guy. I figured I'd try to understand the actor by performing one of his roles. If I ever felt the jarring thwack of returning memories, it was sitting in that plane singing along to Loretta Lynn's Rated X. I found out that I knew all the lyrics to every song that was played, but the lyrics didn't return in a flash. Instead, I knew them a half second before I was supposed to sing them. The song lyrics I somehow knew, but I was still relying on what others told me about who I was. And the guy coming on in between songs, blathering nonsense about alien gods, having scooped up the infant George Jones and touched his throat with their golden antennae, that guy wasn't helping at all. Thank you. And, and I'm happy to take questions. This all was because of an anti-malarial drug. I was taking larium. Um, as much as the book is uh, a story of my experience, it's also the history of malaria and this drug, uh, Larium, um, which is a, a stunning drug. Um, it's now being joked about as a, a psychotropic drug with uh, uh, anti-malarial uh, fighting properties as a side benefit. Um, uh, right now, the drug's being used in, in uh, studies in, at Brown University to learn how different neural pathways in the brain work specifically. Um, the drug's teaching us things about the brain by screwing them up. Um, so that's the drug. Um, and I'm always happy to take any questions. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, so one of the main things I love about this and uh, Dan is that all memoirs ultimately are about the meaning of the self. But this one is literally overtly When I was reading it, I was reminded of one of my favorite lines from Kurt Vonnegut, who said, we are who we pretend to be, so let's be careful about who we pretend to be. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk about that process of faking it till you make it. How did you pretend to be yourself and keep 
I think anyone in this room who's ever had issues with uh, mental illness or uh, just being in a bad mood um, knows that the easiest way for no one to know that is to shut up. <laughs> like if you shut up, it's amazing because everybody actually wants you to be okay. Um, because if you're not okay, then it's an extra chore for them. Right? And so if you just be okay, <laughs> then everybody will be like, well, he's okay. Um, and that's sort of how I figured out how to do this. Um, if I, One of the things that happens in the book is I go back to India within a month of this happening, um, which sounds crazy. Um, and I was definitely faking it. I, was, I, I just sort of told my parents I was fine um, and, and went back. Um, if I had stayed in central Ohio and was confronted every day with being the sick person and was confronted every day with, be, with, with things that I didn't know, I would have gone crazy and I probably would have killed myself. And that's not a, a slam against central Ohio. Um, <laughs> um, when I went back to India though, um, when I was the blonde guy in the Tarnaka section of Secunderabad, uh, no one expected me to know anything. And in fact, people went out of their way to tell me that I didn't know anything every day. And in some ways, that allowed me to work on foundational personality stuff rather than being haunted all the time by the stuff I didn't know. Um, and it turned out to be the smartest dumb decision I've ever made. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's a book about, uh, about memory that... that is about sort of circling this absence um, and riding, riding a BMX bike around the absence at the edge of town um, is sort of the way I approach it. Um, No, no, no. I, I think I, if I'll try to answer it, and then we'll get the PS. Or is that the PS? Okay. So I'll try to answer it this way. Um, I often think that the the hardest thing about getting to the real author is the author. Um, I think often the author, what the author wants to write, and what the author wants to produce, um, get in the way of writing the thing itself. Um, and that's a hard thing to give up. It's a hard thing to give up. And it's also a thing, as English students, you probably all have had that conversation. What did the author intend? In some ways, that question means nothing. Like, really means nothing. Um, it's what the work is doing. Um, and what, when you sit down to write, whatever gets you to that place to write is great. You know, what you want to write. How wonderful that thing is. Um, and how terrible and crippling it is for you now to see what you have written. Because you're always going to be haunted by this, oh, what you want to write. <laughs> right? It's like a tumor. It sits right there on your optic nerve. And you can't see what you have written. And what you have written usually is the true self that's, that's getting, that's circumventing the, the, the brain of the author um, who wants to be charming, who wants to have sex with people, who wants money, who wants all of these accolades, right? And it's that that's the important thing. Um, that's the moment of writing that I always get excited about, is when you encounter that. Um, I think that's, 
I feel like it's not something you can create a really significant diagram to always find the truth, um, but it's usually in places where the guardedness and the attention seeking drop away um, and you feel a sort of nakedness in the work. Um, and it's usually, as Nabokov says, it's usually it grabs you right about here um, in your spine. Um, that's when you know it's something real. Um, but how much of that is the real reader or the reader who wants to be smart and wants to understand things? Um, I know I'm an aspirational reader. Um, whenever I pick up Derrida, I'll never get through Derrida. Um, but sometimes I like to pick it up and be like, oh, look at me, reading Derrida. <laughs> um, even though it, like, it means nothing to me, like, and I, I can't track it. Um, but, but there's the lying self that gets in the way. Does that make, is that? Okay. okay. Yes, Russ, were you there studying? I was there, so you guys can answer this. So, uh, so, my, so when I was at New Mexico State, what I was doing was I was working with a professor who used low directional interviews <clears throat> with people. Um, and low directional interviews just means you keep your uh, interviewer's voice off the tape as long as you can and just let the other person talk. And it didn't matter what they talked about. Um, and so what I wanted was, and what he and I would work on was figuring out spoken grammar. Right, and that's what we were both really interested in was spoken grammar. Each of us have our own spoken grammar. How does that work? How can that function in writing fiction? So what I wanted to do was go to a place, especially uh, Hyderabad, where Telugu, Tamil, and Hindi are all spoken, um, as well as English. And anyone who speaks English is multilingual, other than me. Um, and so I would do these uh, low directional interviews with um, people in, in English and then analyze the grammatical structures in the other language that they spoke and saw how those grammatical structures inflected the way they composed sentences in English, looking for a sort of meta-grammatical, uh, spoken grammatical style. Um, but then uh, this happened. I'm sorry, I kind of sidetracked it. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, Christina. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because like this is the best way I can explain it. Maybe there are enough comic book nerds in the audience. Um, so Matt Murdock uh, was, was crossing a street and he got hit by a, a radioactive isotope, as these things are. <laughs> um, and he was blinded, and, but all of his other senses were dialed up, right? And so there's always this scene in Daredevil comic books where Matt Murdock wakes up and he can hear everything down the hall, everything, and he can sense everything that's scratching on the sheets is too much for him. And he can smell like the cologne of a guy four blocks away, right? And so he, he sort of gets lost in sense data. When I woke up, I was kind of like Matt Murdock without the acrobatic skills. Um, <laughs> but what narrative does, what our narratives do, is it gives us a way to rank data information. Um, any information coming in, we can rank it according to what we need to get done there. Um, if you're at a train station and you need to get on a train, you can see the trains coming and going. You can see the TV. But you sort of block out everything else in order to be sane. Um, in order to just sit here and listen, we have to sort of ignore the, the, uh, the car noises outside, the weird humming of the um, whatever. <laughs> is. Um, like we have to do that that's in a way to keep us sane because this is our narrative this is what we're paying attention to this is what we're doing um, and so as soon as Rajesh gave me the information that I was a drug addict suddenly I had a hierarchy suddenly I knew how to rank data information um, whereas before I didn't um, everything meant as much to me it was a flat field 
in some way. Anything meant as much to me as anything else. Um, and then as soon as I found out the kind of person I was, then I knew shame. Then I knew to feel all of these other things. Is that kind of? Gotcha. Okay. So if you've ever woken up from a nightmare or a bad dream, um, especially if you're in a relationship, especially if it was about that person, right? And the rest of the day, you sort of have this thing where you have these emotions that are dieseling out in your brain. Um, and you sort of like, are you trying to kill me? <laughs> I'm not positive, but I think you're trying to kill me. <laughs> No, that's a, and you 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 can recognize you're like oh of course not that's stupid dreaming that's what it was like um, like Jim Henson showed up to me as God right and Jim Henson said I could uh, it's all in the book <laughs> uh, Jim Henson told me that I could I could enter into the next level of of, of consciousness if I could just recite a quatrain <laughs> and so when I woke up I felt not only was I killing my mother by being a drug addict but I was also rejected by God. Um, this is my new superpower, I found out. I can make people laugh and then make them feel bad about themselves and immediately after. Um, like, I was, that fucked with me um, for years um, uh, because I felt like I had been rejected and I was living in this world as a consolation prize. Um, and... Uh, and so it was hard for me to take this life seriously for a long time because, you know, Jim Henson takes you on a tour of the cosmos. It's like, that's where it's at. <laughs> um, but then rational brain is like, oh, right, drugs. <laughs> um, so, yeah, does that make, is that, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, I felt that a lot of your difficulty when you woke up and found yourself in this place uh, is what that is what directly comes across as vividly intriguing to us when we read it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was wondering as to what you thought of, uh, what part of this intrigue came from the fact that you were in an alien land, that people around you didn't look like you, they didn't talk like you. Uh, I mean, if you would to compare it with, say, a similar experience uh, that you might have in your own native town. Right. Uh, how do you look at it? How did the location play a role in your consciousness at that particular moment? It's a perfect question. And one of the things that I wrestled with in this book a lot was I'm not the first white person who's gone to India and written about India, right? Um, and usually it's done in very stereotypical ways. Um, and one of the things that was on my side on this was I went back to Ohio Fresh from the asylum, I will say. Um, fresh from the asylum, go back to Ohio. Uh, my parents go to bed. I turn on the television. And what's on TV but Al Roker's gastric bypass surgery? <laughs> and it was at that moment where, like, central Ohio was as alien a land as India could ever be. Because, like, once you see, like, the insides of the weatherman, like, yeah. splayed out on the television... Like, there's nothing, I gotta say, and, and I've been back to India several times, I've never seen anything like that. Um, but as soon as you, as soon as I say to you all, most of you are like, oh, Al, he's, he's struggled with his weight for years and he's always been open with his listeners. You know, and so like, you have this narrative that takes in this absolutely absurd, ridiculous thing that we watched Al Roker <laughs> out on the on the table and so that's something that was really important to me um, is that even home was alien um, and then when I was in New Mexico uh, that was alien as well um, and being in a relationship with the person I was in a relationship was alien um, like what it does is it cuts context and as soon as you have don't have context like everything becomes alien you start to realize like how much of this the cultural programming is always there operating and even even then the supposed blank slate 
the cultural programming is probably still operating. There's no doubt. Um, I don't think any of us are ever totally deracinated. <laughs> um, I don't think that's possible. Um, I don't think any of us would want it. Um, but it was, it was sort of an interesting thing and a challenge that I thought about a lot was um, I didn't want this book to be, um, you know, he lost his mind. But wait, in India, <laughs> right? Like I really didn't want that. And, and so I've, I've, I, I tried to work really hard against that. Um, does that answer your question? I think for a long time, and I think, and, and I don't know, I don't know if this would have happened naturally, but for a long time I wanted to be um, clever, really, really wanted to be clever. And I don't know if that was a, a symptom of, of being young and, and growing up in the era of David Foster Wallace and, and all of the bright boys of the 90s, um, and really wanting to, to just astonish the world with how clever I was. And that was hard to give up. At some point, I, I, it got boring to me. Um, as a writer, I hit a dead end. And I realized it was just bad architecture. And it wasn't stories. It was bad architecture. Um, and it was architecture that sort of was training um, at the same time. And that's what clever fiction often feels like to me, is, is training. Um, and so it was nice because it, it broke that down. Um, and I was a fiction writer. And I was writing fiction, uh, getting my PhD writing fiction. And, uh, and I noticed that again and again, I would have characters who had lost time in their lives uh, through jail, through bad relationships, through uh, custody battles, all of these different ways. And then I looked at my fiction, and I was like, oh, I'm not writing something. I'm going out of my way to not write something. Um, so this was my attempt to actually write the thing that I was not writing in my fiction. Um, yeah, so like I had to, this first 50 pages I wrote nine times um, because I had to strip away all the cleverness, all the self, self-preservation and all the, 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 I wanted people to walk away from this book thinking, oh, isn't he so charming? <laughs> Rather than, uh, wow, that sucked, right? Because I was like, then I lose my identity. It's, it's just... Uh, but I had to finally be like, maybe it did just suck. Maybe you just have to let it suck. I don't know. Maybe? I don't know. Any other questions? Yeah. So, um, you were saying that you were considering to read the Hebrew Bible to your students. Like, that's one of the things that you said, to read the Great Book to your readers. What kind of things did you find that was so important to you? This is a really great uh, question because. It's right at the edge of this sort of Mefloquine research. Mefloquine is the, what is it called? The generic name of Larian. And so what, it's ta what we're looking at, I'm not personally, but the scientists I talked to. <laughs> um, because I had uh, emotional memory. I had, like, when my parents came in, I felt what it was like. I knew what it was like to have parents, right? Like, I could... I could feel like, oh, good. <laughs> um, um, I knew what passport was. I knew that looking at the TV was helpful. I knew all of those things. But I didn't have narrative memory. And what The way I've tried to write this book was very true to the experience. A scientist who consulted me on this book was, uh, was like, what you need to do is get rid of any of the uh, occasions where it looks like you remember something because that will make people feel uncomfortable and think that this didn't happen. And I was like, well, the way it felt was it was like a spasming. And there were times that I would remember things and times that I didn't and times that I was off totally. There were times that I'd wake up in the middle of talking to people. Um, so that's the way I've tried to write the book uh, as true to the experience. I think oftentimes a diagnosis is a writer's worst friend. <laughs> um, <coughs> because then the writer will write to the diagnosis rather than 
our illnesses usually aren't polite enough to just stop at the diagnosis of borders. Um, and so that's the way I try to write the book. Sure. Oh, go ahead, please. Those are those are two questions, and, I, and I'll answer the first one first. Um, I think any any mental illness, any mental um, instability, like you always sort of blame yourself because nobody else seems to be having this problem, um, and then you're like, oh, there's something cellularly wrong with me that this happened, as opposed to <clears throat> if my arm got cut off, I wouldn't be like, isn't this just like me? I'm just the kind of person who would lose his arm, right? There's, there's a difference there that I think is always really interesting to me. Um, that when we have moments where we don't feel like everybody else, we think everybody else is feeling, I just blame myself, I would tell you. And it took me a while to, because I was terrified, I'm still vaguely terrified, <clears throat> that it wasn't delirium, that it was just um, who I am. And that I'll reset every uh, however many years like a cicada, um, and uh, and that's terrifying. Um, more than likely, it's delirium, and I'm not a cicada either. More than likely. Um, and then your second question, you know, it's hard to tell now who I am now uh, as a result of this experience is uh, is because of the drug uh, or because of the trauma. So I have been diagnosed with PTSD uh, by the worst uh, therapist in New Mexico. Um, <laughs> I, but the new research is saying that PTSD um, can often be used to misdiagnose mefloquine poisoning. Um, and mefloquine poisoning, um, PTSD, as we all know, is sort of like poof, going through the roof with our, our uh, veterans. Um, and that what some of these people might be experiencing is not PTSD, but mefloquine poisoning. And no amount of talk therapy is gonna help um, mefloquine poisoning. Um, so in terms of who I am today, my mom says I'm more serious than I was before. Um, there are days I agree with her, um, and days that I, I think I'm more patient than ever. Um, but, uh, but yeah, is that? And one more question. Yes, sir. Sorry, Dan, you already asked the question. Um, is there any actual evidence that psychedelics would improve any mood or anything? Yeah, yeah. No, it's just the sort of, yeah, it's just the sort of uh, standard, I guarantee you Rajesh has seen that like eight times a week. <laughs> right. Yeah, but he but he just took me and then left after he left. It went to the guest house. So like Rajesh has probably done this uh, many times, and it's also he's got a reason. There are a lot of pharmaceutical tourists uh, in India. Um, by the first time I went to India, I traveled with two of them. Um, I loved them dearly. Um, they weren't very interested in museums. Uh, I will say that I'll, I'll tell you this story. Uh, so they would go to the pharmacist every day to see what kind of drugs they could get. And one time they went to the pharmacist in the Paraganj in New Delhi, which is the tourist ghetto of New Delhi, and, uh, and asked if they could get ketamine, which is a horse tranquilizer. And, uh, and they were, the, the pharmacist was like, yes, but you have to come in the back. Um, we only have it in a liquid form, so we'll have to inject you. And I will say to my friend's credit, that was the line they didn't cross. They didn't go to a back alley to be injected with ketamine. And, I, and, I, and I'm proud of them for that. That was... The, they, would, they would be so happy. Like, what was it? It was like Titanic was playing at the time. 
So they could like be on ketamine and go see three hours of air-conditioned Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm sure that was their...